Across the world lie the blueprints of our past. Distant civilizations that once ruled supreme have now become hidden by time and nature. But beneath the desert sands and dense jungles remain the clues to find them. These trails lead us back to the extraordinary cultures that built the foundations of our past and were to shape our future. Deep in the jungles of Mexico lies one of the greatest lost cities of the New World. Built 1,500 years ago by a civilization known as the Maya, this great city flourished for centuries before being mysteriously abandoned by its people. Now, using the latest technology, a team of scientists, engineers, and archaeologists are discovering how these incredible structures were built and revealing what they were used for. Their mission? To crack the secret codes of the past and bring to life wonders from a lost world. They examine an ancient formula known as sacred geometry that underpins the city's grand design. And they uncover the extraordinary secrets of its great ruler and architect whose hidden tomb went undiscovered for 1,200 years. The breakthroughs the team are making will change our understanding of this great Maya city forever. My mapping team found 1,500 buildings out there in the jungle is a whole lost world. In the rainforests of Central America lie the remains of a once great city. It was built by an extraordinary people called the Maya. Their civilization began around 3,000 years ago and prospered for two and a half thousand years. While Europe languished in the Dark Ages, the Maya were devising sophisticated geometry and astronomy, writing books and creating trade routes. Maya culture centered around an elaborate religion of ritual and sacrifice. Their society developed into powerful city-states. Among the greatest of these was Palenque. 800 years before Columbus reached America, Palenque was already a vibrant metropolis. Great palaces and temples soared above the Mexican plain. The city had plazas and even sports arenas. Much of Palenque was the vision of one man, King Pakal, a great ruler and architect. Then suddenly, his city was abandoned, and for a thousand years, Palenque kept its secrets. But now, Dr. Edwin Barnhart's team are gathering the data of every building at this site. We can bring to life their findings and recreate the wonder of King Pakal's lost city. The team start by investigating King Pakal's greatest achievement, his royal palace. Once the epicenter of the city, this extraordinary building contains a labyrinth of passages, staterooms, vaults, and courtyards. The palace is the crowning jewel of Palenque. It sits right in the middle of its main plaza, and it's the focal point of the city. And here was the very first part of the palace to be built, at the heart of the palace is a clue to its founder. This building was in fact the throne room. And you see here a, a limestone tablet which describes exactly the kind of thing that went on here. On the left you see the figure of a woman holding up a headdress, effectively the crown of Palenque, and offering it to this figure cross-legged on his double-headed jaguar throne, which is Pakal. The crowning of King Pakal, recorded on the tablet, would change the fortunes of Palenque forever. Up until now, the royal line had been threatened by countless wars and famine. But when King Pakal took to the throne in 615 AD, 
power was at last restored, and he began a glorious building renaissance unparalleled in the city's history. Pakal reigned for very nearly 70 years. He was 80 by the time he died. And he was responsible for creating a great platform upon which he began the building of a series of quite new structures. King Pakal's palace is the crowning structure of centuries of royal building. Buried beneath it are the palaces of his forefathers. Each king in succession would build a little bit more, build a little taller, build over some of the lower structures to raise up the level of the palace. By 660 AD, the massive stone platform stood 40 feet above the ground and covered over 72,000 square feet, the size of the largest football stadium today. But where did they get the millions of tons of stone to build it? This is all local limestone, probably some of it quarried from where they flattened out areas here in the site to create places for buildings to go. Others were probably from across the mountains and drug over the mountains and down here into the city. The Maya were expert stonemasons. Their techniques differed little from those in use today. Team members Chris Powell and Alonzo Mendez visit one of the quarries that supplied Palenque's builders 1,500 years ago. It's a good quarry to look at when you're trying to make a comparison to what quarrying was like in the classic period. The only difference, of course, being the tools were of wood and stone rather than metal. This limestone quarry was selected then as now for the quantity of its stone and the ease with which the stone could be dug from the ground. The stone is laminated and naturally has separation. The joints separate naturally. There's softer beds and harder beds. So they're taking advantage of that and working uh, the natural striations and laminations. The Maya were skilled at heavy duty quarrying. But what sort of tools did they use? This is the kind of tool that they would have been using in, for a scoring uh, limestone of this, of this quality. A tip like this would be fitted onto a shaft of wood in this way and um, secured to the, to the shaft with, uh, with leather thong. And then in this way they could basically work the limestone, chipping it away. This palace was the ultimate expression of the golden age of King Pakal. These royal buildings with massive walls and steeply sloping ceilings were built upon huge stone platforms. But their large exterior is deceptive. On the inside, they are surprisingly small. The reason was that in 600 AD, the Maya of Central America didn't yet use an incredibly simple device that today we take for granted. Isolated from the rest of the world, the Maya had no knowledge of the keystone arch invented by the Romans centuries earlier. But this didn't matter. The Maya had their own techniques. This is what we call a corbelled arch. Unlike the Romans, the Maya tended to use this kind of form. Romans had a more curved arch with a keystone at the top. The Maya used this kind of construction, using flat stones stacked upon each other in a kind of negative staircase kind of way. Without the keystone arch, the Maya were limited to narrow rooms, each wall requiring huge amounts of stone. Although cumbersome, they did have one major advantage. Stacking them up in such a way where they counterbalanced each other is really a very strong way to build an arch. And one clear testimony is that this is still standing after 1,500 years. But before it was complete, the palace had just one last building to be added, and it would become its centerpiece. A final detail amongst all these elegant, beautiful buildings is the, the palace tower, quite unique in the Maya world, used no doubt as a lookout from which to spot enemies approaching across the plains. But there's also increasing evidence today that this was used as a solar observatory. This is the tallest observatory to be built by the Maya. 
and is aligned precisely to the path of the sun. On special days of the year, the king's priests would gather to witness the sun shine through a strangely designed opening in the tower wall. These distinctive T-shaped openings are to be found all over Pakal's palace, and they had a special meaning. This, in the shape of a T, is the hieroglyphic symbol for wind, or eek, and being a, a place where wind passes through into the interior, it's a proper symbol. The second part of what this T represents is this is the symbol of the lineage of the kings and queens of Palenque. So it's really a double entendre, both where wind passes through and a place where light comes into the lineage. We can now reveal with its vivid colors how the palace would have appeared to the Maya by the 8th century. With its great observatory soaring over the plain the size of the White House, it had sweeping colonnades, open patios, and 12 staterooms. But its darkest secrets lay below. Concealed beneath the grandeur of the palace lies a forbidden underworld. Deep in the jungles of Mexico, a team of archaeologists is mapping the lost world of Palenque, a vast Maya city abandoned over a thousand years ago. Using the latest technology, we can recreate the palace built by King Pakal, Palenque's greatest ruler and architect. Now, project leader Dr. Edwin Barnhart heads underground to explore the lost world that lies beneath the palace. He finds a labyrinth of mysterious chambers, passageways, and vaults. A unique detail provides a clue to what happened here in King Pakal's time. Unlike the decoration of the palace above, down here in the underworld, the capital, T, the symbol of the royal line, is inverted, representing darkness, the underworld, and death. At one point, these were the top buildings of the palace, but with subsequent kings burying over and over them, they became the symbolic underworld of the palace. One indicator of that are these windows. Upside down T's are now reflecting the watery surface of the underworld. This is the symbolic underworld of the palace. Only the kings, queens, and major priests were allowed to enter down here. These subterranean limestone chambers were the most sacred places in the palace. In these man-made caverns, secret, bloody rituals were performed to appease the gods. To the Maya, blood was a gift from the gods. But there was a price. It had to be constantly repaid. King Pakal believed that through ritual bloodletting, he could achieve enlightenment and contact the spirits of his ancestors. The king would ritually mutilate his genitals with a razor-sharp knife and drip the blood onto sacred paper. When the paper was burned, the serpent of visions appeared before the king in the scented smoke. Once the king had entered a trance, it is believed he could contact the dead and absorb their wisdom through his own sacrifice. But the king's blood alone was never enough to satisfy the gods. Above ground, the most gruesome story unfolds. In the largest single area of the palace is an open court where once terrible scenes of human sacrifice took place. Here was where Palenque and its rulers could really show off exactly how powerful they were. And you can imagine Pakal and his entourage seated at the top of these steps and visitors being brought into the courtyard below, looking up at this impressive array of people in feather headdresses and jaguar skins and so on. 
by the middle of the century, by the 660s, Palenque was prospering again, and Pakal himself was doing what all Maya rulers were meant to do, which was to wage war and bring back captives for sacrifice. The court buildings appear to have been built by the king to impose a sense of fear into his victims, as well as allowing his subjects to witness the bloody executions. You can imagine the very men being brought here, terrified probably, being uh, humiliated, bled in various ways, and eventually killed, sacrificed. Even the steps here seem to be calculated to discomfort, to really terrorize. As you go down the steps, they get steeper and steeper. So once the captive had reached the bottom of these stairs and he turned towards the Lord of Palenque and saw him in all his finery opposite, he knew his fate was sealed. His death was inevitable. We can now reveal how the main palace court looked in its glory. A majestic arena designed to display the glory of the king's reign and to receive the blood of his many captives. But while blood might have appeased the gods, Palenque's citizens were concerned with a much more pressing problem, which only their ingenuity could solve. Flooding. Beneath the city, engineer Kirk French has discovered how Palenque was able to flourish. The answer, aqueduct. This aqueduct, as you'll see, well, the exit is still in excellent condition. The stones are large and massive. It's withstood 1,200 rainy seasons. It's somewhat of a misnomer when we call Palenque's aqueducts aqueducts because it conjures up an idea of Roman aqueducts, which is taking water from one location and taking it to a city which is in need of water. Palenque's aqueducts don't really have that same function. Palenque had water at its source right here in the city, and the purpose for its aqueducts were to take the water through the site in an efficient manner. With a high annual rainfall of 85 inches, Pakal's engineers were faced with a problem. Each rainy season, rivers and streams threatened to flood the city center. On that small area, they have nine waterways that flow through this escarpment. Each of these waterways, through erosion, eat up a swath about seven meters wide. But the engineers came up with an ingenious solution. What they did was they dug out the pre-existing stream that was here, walled it, and then actually covered it with a corbelled arch. And they pretend as if that stream was never there. This remarkable aqueduct allowed the citizens to reclaim many acres of prime land right in the heart of the city. The Maya may have lacked the Roman arch, but their knowledge of hydraulics was every bit as good. This massive aqueduct is over 400 feet long, 12 feet high, and 15 feet wide. Today, the ancient corbelled arches continue to carry the huge weight of the stone-flagged plaza above. Here, Kirk can uncover an exact timeline of the Mayan engineering. We're directly beneath the floor of the main plaza. And what we have here is this aqueduct was built in several phases, probably around the time of Pakal. And this is a perfect example of how the phases change. You can tell this used to be the entrance to this aqueduct. You can tell the architecture, the plaster here, stucco, it goes beneath the wall. And then the architecture changes as they built on and put an addition onto the aqueduct, thus making it much longer. By using aqueducts, Maya engineers could reclaim precious land, prevent flooding, and provide fresh running water to every home across the city. Funneling the torrents down ever narrowing channels, the Maya achieved the impossible they discovered a way to make water run uphill. 
Because Palenque had water pressure technology, it would have been easy to divert a section of this aqueduct to bring water up to the palace. Pakal may even have had his very own flushing throne. Working without metal tools, Pakal's engineers tamed 30 miles of streams and rivers and channeled over a million gallons of water a day. While the aqueducts remained hidden below ground, King Pakal also created a vast monument that would be seen across the city. Soaring over a hundred feet into the air, it is known as the Temple of the Inscriptions. In the heart of the Mexican rainforest, a team of scientists, archaeologists, and engineers are resurrecting the lost city of Palenque. Abandoned for over a thousand years, these magnificent buildings are finally revealing how they once looked over 1,200 years ago. Already, we have brought back to life its largest complex, the palace, and have seen that the Maya were skilled engineers and ambitious builders, a match for the Romans with their aqueducts, and now echoing the ancient Egyptians with a pyramid. Now the team examine this incredible structure. It is Palenque's greatest temple and stands over a hundred feet high. Deep within lies the Maya world's most astounding secret, a secret hidden by its architects for over a thousand years. Built out of limestone blocks, the Temple of Inscriptions is comparable to the stepped pyramids of the ancient Egyptians. And with a base of 35,000 square feet, it became the city's greatest landmark. Now, we're at the very top of the pyramid in the inner chamber of the Temple of the Inscriptions, so called because of these marvelous panels of pure Maya hieroglyphs. And what they give you are the histories of the Palenque royal line. This intricate carving was only made possible by an incredible piece of ancient technology, unsurpassed to this day. Without metal tools of any kind, the ancient Maya were able to manufacture the sharpest blade that mankind has ever produced. It was made from a form of volcanic glass called obsidian. The Maya were expert blade makers, and I cannot re replicate their finest work. The obsidian blades would have been used for the fine carving, the finished carving. Probably nowhere else using Stone Age technology will you see masonry done so cleanly and so fine with such good quality results. Here, Chris demonstrates the Mayan technique for making their tools. The first step is to try to knock off a flake. These flakes come off the back. The smaller flakes, such as this, this is so fine. The, uh, the glass, the volcanic glass, actually when you fracture it, it feathers out to one atom of thickness. It's one of the sharpest um, materials on, on the planet. It's used for eye surgery, actually. But it wasn't just the inscriptions displayed across this building, which were to captivate archeologists. Its real prize lay out of reach for centuries. Hidden beneath the stone foundations lay a treasure that would change the face of Maya archaeology. In 1949, the Mexican archaeologist Alberto Ruz was doing some restoration in the temple here. He noticed on the, on the floor here, there are these very curious circular holes in a big uh, limestone slab. So he prized open the slab, and underneath was the beginnings of a staircase going down. Ruse had found the first staircase ever discovered inside a Maya pyramid. The world of archaeology was stunned, but this was just the beginning. Late in 1952, after nearly four years of e excavating the rubble from the staircase, they came to something of a halt because they found they couldn't go any further. Then they looked around and they found on this side of the, the chamber 
plastered over was a slab, a triangular slab, which is, which is behind me here. This is, this is the one. And they, they, they scraped away the plaster. They very slowly levered the door open. And this was the real Howard Carter Tutankhamun moment. Inside was a big chamber. This was the first royal tomb ever found inside a Maya pyramid. So King Pakal hadn't vanished along with his people as history records. Here he lay, preserved in his own tomb. The slab had one of the most beautiful carvings that the Maya ever executed. It shows the great King Pakal falling down the world tree, heading down into the underworld to do battle with the Lords of Death. So King Pakal hadn't vanished along with his people, as history often records. Here he lay preserved in his own tomb. Inside the tomb was the body of the king himself. And the hole that he was actually placed in was human shaped. It has a place for his feet and it bows out where his body is. And it was covered in red cinnabar. This is a sacred substance that symbolizes blood. But cinnabar, when you burn it, turns into mercury. It would become a mirror, another symbol of the supernatural world. He had a jade mask on his face. And the great architect's tomb presented another engineering puzzle. The tomb lid is five tons. The sarcophagus is 15 tons. And they are down in a place where the staircase is much more narrow than these single pieces of stone. Doing architectural probes showed no evidence of the building being broken into to put these in. So how did the Maya get the tomb inside the pyramid? The answer explains how the whole structure was built. The first step was to excavate out the hillside that it's now wedged into. They had to cut away a place for it to have a flat bottom and to dig into the natural hillside. Then they would bring in the sarcophagus and the lid. Then they build the chamber around that. Then from there, they can start building the temple. But unlike many other Maya buildings, they have to build the staircase in the whole time. So they're going in a very level by level way, coming up to the midpoint where the staircase has its landing, then back around. And then finally, the top covers the temple completely and the tomb is locked within it. Working in complete isolation, King Pakal had arrived at a similar pyramid design for his tomb as the ancient pharaohs of Egypt had done. And like the Egyptian builders, his tomb incorporated an ingenious feature. This is an extraordinary little stone kind of box or tube which climbs all the way up the stairs from the tomb right to the temple at the top. And what they seemed to want to do was to be able to communicate with their ancestor, with the, with the dead king. Effectively, they believed that the spirit of, of Pakal was accessible and would come along this tube and would appear in the temple. The engineering brilliance on the inside of the temple was hidden from public view. Only the highest ranking officials, the priests, courtiers, and members of the king's family could ever experience this window into their past. But outside, the seventh century inhabitants of Palenque were bedazzled by the temple of the inscriptions. Adorned with ornate carvings, the massive temple could be seen from miles around. So far, the team has learned how King Pakal, one of the greatest builders in Maya history, constructed one of the most ambitious cities of all time. It had a magnificent palace, aqueducts running beneath the ground, and a vast pyramid for his own tomb. But the next part of their survey solves an enigma. Across the plaza from the palace, lie two buildings, mirror images of each other. The grass verges beside them once sloped inwards. Early explorers had no explanation for them. But nowadays we know from the structure of the place, you've got a, uh, the, the, the two uh, sloping walls facing each other, a kind of capital I shape down the middle, and two end zones to, to either end of the court. We know what this was for. It was for the Mesoamerican ball game. But this was no ordinary ballpark. 
Its design symbolized the gates of the underworld. And the game recreated the triumph of life over death. Gods known as the Hero Twins defeated the Lords of Death in a ball game, with the possibility that the ball could even have been a human head. The ball court with the sloping sides here is almost like a kind of crack in the earth and people used to imagine the hero twins descending into the earth to confront the lords of death, the lords of the underworld. To the thousands watching from the wooden terraces, this was more like witnessing a day at the Colosseum than a game in the World Series because the king himself was guaranteed to be the star player. What happened was that the rulers themselves participated in what were in fact kind of reenactments of the tussles with the gods of death. And you may have had captives brought here onto the ball court, but they were the people who were destined to lose. They'd be involved in a game which would end up with them almost certainly being sacrificed, maybe their heads cut off or being dismembered. In a sense, it was all one big propaganda effort on behalf of the, uh, the rulers of the Maya. To the crowd, this arena and the highly choreographed events held here were a graphic demonstration of the absolute power of their king. And Pakal proclaimed his glory in other ways too. The Palenque we see today is a bare limestone ruin. But back then, images of the royal line adorned every available surface of his great buildings. They were festooned with highly colored hieroglyphs, sculptures, and friezes. To find out how they made their pigments, Ed has brought some rare samples for archaeologist Alfonso Morales to put under the microscope. The source of red is just plain clay and then the medium to make it stable. The yellow is also a yellow clay. You dry it out, then uh, make it into a powder. Then we have the source of a black that you can get out of carbon or soot out of the fireplaces. Maya artists would venture far from Palenque in search of pigments to adorn their great city. One of these was a vibrant blue color, which they extracted from plants like the anil tree. I've seen an anil tree, it's like a bush, right? Mm -hmm. But is right. it berries or is it the leaves that leaves. they're where, the leaves are where they're getting the blue out of? Mm -hmm. So that's right. a combination of organic and mineral the that they're pretty... putting together. By the eighth century, Pakal's great city had become the envy of the Maya world. As beautiful as Paris and larger than eighth century London. The team now focuses their attention on a group of temples in the center of the city. One of them, known as the Temple of the Sun, was like an oracle for every man, woman, and child in Palenque. We're in the Temple of the Sun, and this building, we've always felt, was oriented to the other buildings of the cross group in a way that would let the sun come through in a special way. Maya civilization relied entirely upon agriculture. A bad harvest could have meant starvation. So it was critical for their survival to reap and sow at exactly the right time. To help them, Pakal's engineers looked to the heavens for the solution. The team believed that they built this temple as a sophisticated sundial, but it has never been proven. So now, the team take up the challenge and set out to test their theory. If they are right, then the sun's rays should strike a precise point in the temple on key days in the solar year. The team has waited months for this, and today the sun is at its highest point of the summer. The zenith passage is the day of the year, it happens twice a year, where the sun is directly overhead at noon. Zenith marks the time to plant corn in, in the highlands here. If the team is right, the sun's rays should penetrate the temple of the sun like a laser passing through the eye of a needle. The first rays of light are coming right into this corner to create a spot right here only at the sunrise. Lasting just a few seconds, this is the moment of truth. Just as they'd hoped, the sun's rays strike the edge of the chamber precisely. 
too exact to be mere coincidence. So the team now compare other parts of the temple to see if they correspond to key dates in the Maya year, like the summer solstice and the equinox. In the equinox, it comes in from that beam, hits this beam, this beam, and comes directly into this corner. In the summer solstice, the sun is farther over, and it's creating a beam of light that gets cut by this beam and this beam to create a beam of light very thin, about this thin, that goes into that corner. All of these phenomena happen just at the first rays of light. Taken together, these three readings reveal how precisely the temple was constructed. But just how did the Maya engineers go about it? Well, if you waited before you built your building and placed straight sticks in the ground, make sure they're perfectly straight and anchor them into your floor, and wait for the summer solstice sunrise, wait for the zenith sunrise, wait for the equinox, and on those moments when the sun strikes your building platform and those sticks, mark the angle of the shadows in lines, just draw them on your platform. Then you design your building around those angles, knowing beforehand exactly how the sun is going to enter the building. And you can manipulate your walls and entrances and so forth to take advantage of the effect of light and shadow. This magnificent temple controlled the rhythm of life in the city. But it was the harmony of their designs which was to lead the team to an even greater discovery. King Pakal's great building program transformed Palenque into the jewel in the crown of Maya cities. But King Pakal's building extended beyond the city center, where over 700 houses and homesteads lie scattered across the landscape. For the first time, the team can truly appreciate the breathtaking size of this metropolis. And it's here, in the sprawling residential suburbs, that team leader Ed Barnhart makes a surprising discovery. When we were doing the residential survey, we expected to find mainly thatch huts, but instead what we found were buildings that were made primarily out of stone, like this one. This one had walls of stone and even a stone roof. And it was obvious to me that multiple generations had lived here. These were sophisticated housing estates with enclosed gardens and running water, just as we have today. As the family expanded, they put in stub walls like this to subdivide the space further and to allow their burgeoning family to live in their own private little sections. As time went on, they even built a second story onto this building, also with a stone roof. And they built staircases from below going to the roof above, much like we'd envision a modern condo. It was here, in these houses, where the team discovered the formula behind every building at Palenque. For over a century now, Mayanists have been looking for a Maya unit of measure. And we've never found it. All right, Her vertical. There is no specific unit of measure used for these cities. Amazingly, we can now see that the entire city was built without any form of specific measure. No meters, no feet or inches, no calibration or standard whatsoever. There's no standardized unit for building. Instead, they look at it in terms of proportions. The team now believe that Pical's engineers used rope to make up four interlocking circles. These would create the corners of a square. The rope was also used to measure a diagonal and draw an arc. By repeating this simple process, Pakal's engineers were able to design some of the most beautiful buildings in the Maya world. But the team have now discovered the real reason which lies behind this unique method. There's a certain set of geometric forms that we call sacred geometry. They're based on the shapes of nature and the Maya were using this technique to lay out their buildings and their cities. Every Maya design, even the basic square, was derived from flower patterns and shapes from nature. They were trying to emulate nature and by utilizing the proportions found in nature. 
In fact, a shaman once told me after sitting in a dirt floor house how to use the cord and make the system of, of proportions. He, uh, he explained to me that, well, the shapes of the flowers are in our houses. The team have revealed how Pakal developed Palenque into a metropolis. From the tallest pyramid to the smallest house, all were engineered by using just simple square and circle shapes. The city would later be abandoned by its people, but King Pakal ensured that Palenque's secret was kept safe. When his long reign ended, Pakal made sure that the sacred symbols were buried with him. He had in one hand a sphere of jade, and the other hand he had a cube of jade. He went to the other world with these symbols of the geometry that he relied upon to build these buildings. Even in death, the great king could not be parted from the key geometric shapes that made the building of this awe-inspiring city possible. Now, after the team's research is complete, we can see how the ancient city of Palenque would have looked in all its splendor. A stunning metropolis. Painted in brilliant red, the whole city shone like a beacon for miles around, inspiring awe, fear, and wonder. But inside, King Pakal's builders had designed a sophisticated infrastructure. Their knowledge of hydraulics enabled them to funnel water uphill and provide a constant supply, just as we have today. They built hundreds of two-story homes to house the city's 10,000 inhabitants. Maya observations of the sun had led them into geometry, creating elaborate designs. They constructed solar temples to govern the patterns of their lives, telling them when to plant, reap, and sow. Nothing was an obstacle for their ingenuity. An entire mountainside was cut away to build Pakal's own tomb. Like a Roman emperor, King Pakal had built great courts to hold the most bloodthirsty games. Below ground, his builders had created man-made caverns whose thick limestone walls had once echoed with the sounds of ritual and bloody sacrifice. And high above the city, they had built an observatory, the height of a seven-story building. Independent from all other cultures, the Maya tackled every area of engineering to create Palenque. Its most visionary buildings were the creation of King Pakal, and they stand to this day marking the pinnacle of Maya achievement.